Uh, Dr. Simon Mills is a barrister and author. He's a former doctor as well. He's with me now in the studio and was one of the three experts giving uh, evidence and giving testimony to the committee today. Uh, Simon Mills, you're welcome to the studio. Um, first of all, we are watching this on television, those of us who aren't there, and, and it has been quite a measured debate so far. Was that your experience in the chamber? I think so. Um, I, in fact, ironically enough, I think perhaps the, the only person uh, who, who may have stepped outside the... Uh, the, the measured debate may have been me uh, in that perhaps I uh, I went a little far in certain sarcastic remarks I made in relation to uh, a question asked by, by Deputy Flanagan. But aside from that, it is uh, collaborative, it's collegiate, it's a, a process of, of careful, thorough and informed inquiry. Uh, I was greatly heartened by the depth of consideration that had been given to the matter by the people asking questions and also greatly heartened by their willingness to uh, to listen to responses even in circumstances where perhaps intuitively or philosophically the people asking the questions uh, were not that receptive to the legal answers being given. Uh, on that point uh, of it, it being reasonably well informed in the questioning that went there the point I was trying to make earlier on was that we don't have the, the wording of this legislation. We're working in somewhat of a vacuum somewhere in government it is being drawn up we well, don't know what it is, so what, what is the point of these hearings? Well, this is something that has uh, arisen uh, ever since the, the, the government announced that it was going to, uh, and when capital letters are almost appropriate, do something about this. Um, it has led to, as it were, a, a, a rush to the lifeboats by certain people who, who want to condemn legislation they haven't even seen. And it has also led to the difficult situation which you identify as what is the point of discussing legislative proposals in, an entire, in a vacuum? Uh, which is why, for the purposes of today, I took the, the perhaps novel step um, of presenting what I think is workable, succinct, concise draft legislation, which should, I think, form the basis for the kind of terminations of pregnancy which are permissible in accordance with Article 43.3 of the Constitution and in accordance with what the Supreme Court has said about that article. Talk, talk us through that because one of the points that was raised by you and by your colleagues inside in, in the Shannon Chamber was that there has to be clarity given to a real and substantial risk to the life of the mother. Is, is that the central point that, that arose out of X that needs to be addressed or is this a more wide-ranging piece of legislation? Well, I, I think there are, there are two ways of looking at what is legally permissible. The first is, what do we know? And the second is, what can we reasonably infer? What we know uh, expressly is what the X case said, which is that one of the scenarios in which a termination of pregnancy will be permissible is where there's a real and substantial risk to the life of the mother, including the threat of suicide. That's there. That's the Supreme Court interpreting Article 43.3. Any legislation that doesn't deal with that will, I think, be unconstitutional. The, the problem is that people uh, are already questioning whether that was a valid judgment of the Supreme Court and it has been raised on this program by a bishop that the, the Supreme Court was wrong on that. In, in legal, on a legal basis, there is, no, there is no justification in saying that. No, I mean, I, I put it this way. If they had decided in the opposite direction and I were to say that I thought that the decision reached by the Supreme Court in the X was the wrong case. A bishop or anybody else from the pro-life side would be very quick to tell me that I was obliged to accept the law of the land. The Supreme Court has spoken on this point and it remains the law. So in this legislation that you have drafted, which, um, which you, I think you were discussing with the committee, what, what, what is in it? What would happen to a woman who says, I, I fear for my life? Well, the first thing to say is that the, that the legislation continues for the time being, uh, or continues sorry, into the future, um, a prohibition on abortion generally, so that it will remain an offence for a person to procure their own abortion or for someone to perform an abortion unless one of the recognised exceptions set out in the bill is satisfied. So what the bill envisages is a, a number of scenarios where exceptions would be created by the law. To deal with the X case examples, first of all, they include the two scenarios where there's a risk, a threat to the life of the mother. The first is arising from some kind of medical circumstances and the other is arising from the threat of suicide. And in both cases, it would be dealt with in circumstances where registered medical practitioners to include at least one registered medical practitioner from the specialty concerned would certify first that there was a real and substantial 
uh, risk to the life of the mother and secondly that that risk could only be averted by the performance of a termination of pregnancy. In the case of medical scenarios I would envisage that it would be one consultant obstetrician and one other consultant from a relevant medical specialty which might be an obstetrician but it might of course be a non-obstetric medical emergency and in the other scenario the threat of suicide I would envisage that at least one of the doctors concerned would be a consultant psychiatrist and also as an additional safeguard one might consider that assessments of suicidality having regard to the evidence that was given yesterday by witnesses might take place on two separate occasions this is all in your this is in the bill so you propose this to be in the legislation not necessarily in regulations that would follow afterwards where it, it, would that be perhaps a little bit too rigid as as uh, given the nature of medicine uh, is, is that too rigid or is that too, arguably too loose? I mean, is well, no, where I, is I, the line drawn? I, know, I, th I think it would be too rigid if it told doctors what decision they should make. All it's doing is saying which doctors should make the decision um, and su su suggesting certain minimum criteria. Now, there are other things that might be included which were adverted to. So Senator Ivana Bacic, for example, uh, talked in one of her questions about an emergency scenario where it's not possible to get two doctors. Senator John Crown raised the important point of resourcing issues where you might have a hospital that only has one obstetrician or one consultant on duty. What happens there? And these are matters that might need to be addressed, but they're matters of practicality, I think, rather than principle. You were raising the point as well about the, the, the labels that have been put on the sides in this debate, the, the suggestion that people are either pro-life or pro-choice. Is that yeah. something you disagree well, with? Well, I, I think there's, there's an unfortunate tendency, and I, I think, alas, the media has to take some blame for this, which is that in order to have good radio or good copy or good television, there must be an agreement of sufficient quantity as to make interesting listening. And in fact, I think there should be a greater emphasis on, on the quality of the disagreement. And I think there's just a general tendency to assume that we are divided neatly into pro-life and pro-choice camps. In fact, I think uh, it's a three-sided debate between those who cleave strongly to pro-life positions, those who cleave strongly to pro-choice positions, and those who adopt moderate positions starting from either camp but coalescing in the middle uh, and I think that there's a sufficient caucus, a sufficient constituency of moderate view such that a bill of the kind that I propose uh, should attract significant support. Would you fear that the debate as it goes on when we eventually do get the legislation when it uh, is being discussed uh, out of the vacuum that those interest groups on either side of that that they, their voices might be louder than those in the middle and as a result we end up with the same kind of paralysis we've had for the last 30 years. But I think that I think the challenge for the media and for our politics and for all of those in the public forum debating this is not to confuse the volume of the voice with the quality of the argument. You remember the law library now, Simon, um, but you were a GP for a considerable length of time as well, were you? That's right, for about 14 years. Okay, so you would have seen people come through your door. Um, so you're, you're not talking without experience in this. How had you, Did you ever encounter pregnant women who said, I, I, am, I may have suicidal tendencies, or, or, or is it as rare as, as was being suggested? Well, in fact, I, th this question was put to me earlier on by, by, by Deputy in Octon, um, I, I would have seen a, a significant but uh, still small number of women who would have been considering terminations of pregnancy. Uh, I would also have seen women who were uh, suicidal by reason of depression during pregnancy. But that's a matter that requires expert assessment. Uh, and in those cases, I would have referred those women onwards. And the judgment of whether or not they fell into the category of people who were depressed by reason of their pregnancy is a matter that a judgment call that was made by people other than me. Can I just ask one other point before we finish up? Is there an inevitability that whenever this legislation is passed by the Oireachtas, as it will be, um, that it may end up in the Supreme Court for testing? Well, it seems probable, I think, that uh, depending on what the contents of the legislation are, if it's a pure X case piece of legislation, which I think would be foolish. I think this is a chance for the legislation to be proactive and not reactive. But if it's pure X case legislation, I don't think there would be any pr purpose to it being referred to the Supreme Court. And it doesn't matter whether there's purpose, but the question is, do you think it'll end up there anyway? Uh, I, I, I think a pure X case legislation is less likely to end up in the Supreme Court. If it goes beyond the X case, then I think it's probable, not certain, that it may well be referred to the Supreme Court for scrutiny under Article 26. And if that doesn't happen, it may well be that there'll be challenges taken from people with either side views on the question of abortion. Simon Mills, a uh, barrister and uh, one of those taking part in that Iraq, this Committee on Health hearing into abortion legislation. Thanks so much for coming in and talking to us on News Talk. Talk lunch